Robert B. Reich is Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley and a Senior Fellow at the Blum Center for Developing Economies. He served in the administrations of Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and most notably, of course, as Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration from 1993 to 97. For his service, Time Magazine named him one of 10 most effective cabinet secretaries of the 20th century. It's amazing they could get to 10, but... He's written 15 books, including the bestsellers uh, 2010's Aftershock, 2012's Beyond Outrage, Saving Capitalism for the Many, Not the Few from 2015, Economics in Wonderland from 2017. He is also a founding editor of the American Prospect Magazine, chairman of Common Cause, and a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and co-creator of the award-winning documentary Inequality for All from 2013, and the Netflix original documentary, Saving Capitalism, which is streaming right now. Available for streaming, you know how that works. Meanwhile, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal is serving her second term representing Washington's seventh district, which encompasses most of Seattle and select environs. She is the, you want to applaud so badly, I don't want to stop you, but um, she is the first South Asian American woman elected to the US House of Representatives and one of only 14 naturalized citizens currently serving in Congress. Congresswoman Jayapal is committed to ensuring that every resident, resident of the district has economic opportunity and a fairer, more equitable society, and, and is the beneficiary of a fairer, more equitable society. She is proud of the district's role in leading the country on issues like the minimum wage, racial equity, and innovation. And I think it's safe to say that most folks in her district are exceedingly proud of her, too. Reich's latest book. Reich's latest book, it's his 18th, I believe, it's called The Common Good, and it's the subject of tonight's talk. And, it, and it's the occasion of his latest exper uh, appearance at Town Hall, his sixth, I believe. When we're trying to imagine how we would re-enter our building after two years and 300 plus events spent roaming King County, we asked ourselves, do you think Robert Reich would come back? <laughs> and then it happened. And he said, how about I invite Pramila Jayapal along with me? And that's the way I'm able to kick off the next 20 years in the life of this organization with the words, please join me in welcoming Robert Reich and Pramila Jayapal. Hello, Seattle. <laughs> we are um, just so thrilled to be here, and uh, I'm going to let our incredibly honored guest start us off for the evening, and then I have a few words to say about Town Hall before we dive into our conversation. Well, first of all, let me just say Happy Labor Day. Of you. And a, and a big congratulations and salute to those of you who are union members here in the hall right now. Uh, and I also want to say a happy town hall coming out and being this extraordinary space. Uh, this is really a privilege to participate in this opening. And finally, I just want to say some words about your member of Congress, who is just about the most fabulous, dedicated, committed, progressive, dynamic, <laughs> fabulous member of Congress. And uh, every time I get a little bit worried about the country, it is people like your member of Congress, this Congresswoman, uh, who cheer me up and I think about where we're going. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Well, I want to just return the praise because we recently got to work together. I called up uh, the secretary and said, will you do a video for us on Medicare for All? Because if you've followed his incredible work, he is a remarkable explainer, of course a brilliant mind, but a remarkable explainer, and he has these great videos on just about every topic you can imagine. 
Um, and he did a fantastic video, so I hope you go search for it because it's really, really excellent. And I just finished reading um, his latest book, which I thought I had brought out here with me, but please get it. It is wonderful, and I think it brings us back to the values that we in Seattle and that all of you in this room and that all of us in the country are really fighting for. So thank you, Secretary Reich, for your, all of your work over the years and for being here with us in Seattle. Uh, thank you. Now, what we thought we would do tonight is well, have can a. Can I just say one thing about Town oh, Hall, yes, really oh, quickly? Yes. I just wanted to say that um, when I was an activist just starting out after 9 11, some of you might remember in 2002, we did our first major event, and it was called Justice for All. And we did it right here in Town Hall, and we had over a thousand people here, and it was folks that you had never probably seen before. It was an incredibly diverse audience, and we did this hearing with our then member of Congress, Jim McDermott, um, and a number of others. Then uh, Congressman Inslee actually was here as a Congress member before he went to be governor, and it was a really remarkable hearing about all the civil liberties abuses that were happening, and so I just want to say Town Hall is such a special institution for all of us because it allows for the kinds of conversation that we are going to have tonight. I want to call out the executive director, Ware Harmon, for his tremendous work and the whole board and community that has supported Town Hall, and how great that it is open again. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of things to talk about. And the question that I keep coming back to is how do we keep our wits and our sanity and our optimism and our goodwill intact when day after day things happen in this country and we hear our president or we read his tweets and we think, how in the world are we going to make it at least to January or February or March or whenever it is, January 2021? 20, uh, so my question for you to begin with is if you look at this big system we're in, and you look at it as a system, a political, economic, sociological system, what would you say are the biggest underlying structural issues that both explain the mess we're in, but also really do need to be tackled? Is that a fair question? It's yes. a big question. <laughs> yes. And we, we only have 40 minutes. <laughs> It is a big question, and I think about it, I've been thinking about this a lot, I just came back from India from three weeks visiting my parents who live there, and um, so I spent a lot of time just thinking about, I did a speech there about how America can regain her heart again. Um, and actually we have a phrase in Malayalam that when you're really frustrated with somebody you love, you say, ayo Pramila, ayo Robert. And so I wanted to title my talk, ayo America because um, I do think that we have, you know, we have some deep structural problems. And I would say that there are three things um, that constitute the totality of it. The first is, and they're all supremacies. The first is corporate supremacy. And I think about that as corporate greed, corporate power, what are corporations um, designed for, and what kinds of powers do they then take, and how do they structurally pay, play into the consolidation of wealth? The second is um, white supremacy. And I think that is, yes, you can clap for that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you should clap for that. But you're, you're, cl you're clapping for the awareness of it, right? That's, that's what we're clapping for. So, <laughs> so and white supremacy, I think, is we have to understand that it didn't start with Donald Trump. And in fact, none of these things started with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a symptom, but he is also now a cause. He is both. 
And with white supremacy, not only do we have the institutionalized barriers that have been there for so long, but we also have now the rolling back of things that we thought we had made progress on. So discrimination in housing, for example, rolling back the fair housing rules, rolling back the, uh, the ability for federal contractors to not discriminate against LGBTQ folks. Um, and so, and then of course the broader institutionalized racism and everything that we saw in Charlottesville, everything we continue to see um, in El Paso. Um, and then the third supremacy is, I think of it as individual supremacy. And, and by the way, the secretary talks about all of these in a slightly different way in your book. But this idea, if you look at it at the, at the national level, you would think about it as the America first policy. Um, at the individual level, it's this idea that the individual takes precedence over the collective. But if you're like us in this room, and I think many people before have said this, Paul Wellstone, I remember saying, We're, you're all better off when you're all better off. You all do better when you all do better. That idea that we as individuals have our rights and our liberties, but we also have as part of that this interconnectedness and this duty to others and to a greater society. And that without that, which in your book you call the common good, which has been known as the common good for so long, that without that a society fails. And so to me it's those three things. They're very intersectional, they're very interdependent. Um, they don't always stop and start separately. They, they're, they're like interlocking Venn diagrams. And if you think about the individual supremacy, um, it in many ways fuels a lot of the corporate greed and the corporate supremacy. But remember when corporations, in order to be chartered, we used to have the power, the citizens had the power to charter corporations, but they were limited in their capitalization, they were limited in their land. Um, there were a lot of things that we put into place to limit the power of corporations, but today, it's corporate power over the environment, corporate power over people's power, corporate power over our democracy. Um, and combine that then with white supremacy and I think you have these structural pieces. Last thing for Labor Day that I wanted to say is we are proud in Washington State to have the third highest union density in the country. And <laughs> And I think the labor movement, um, and my husband, who is the head of the King County Labor Council, is here somewhere. Um, but the labor movement has been really good at taking on the corporate supremacy and taking on the individual supremacy. I think the idea of workers really banding together. It has not always historically been great at taking on white supremacy. But I wanted to call your attention to an op-ed that was just published in The Stand by the Washington State Labor Council President Larry Brown and um, the uh, Tre Secretary Treasurer April Sims saying that we all need to call out white supremacy and really thank them for their leadership and thank our labor leaders in this room who have been fighting for a deeply interconnected um, interracial solidarity of workers from, from everywhere. So I have a question for you, which is, um, I sort of laid out what I see as the problems. There are many more, I'm sure. But before we get to the solutions, how did we get into this mess? What are the things that have happened over the past couple of decades, past many decades, that have led us to this place where we suddenly find ourselves with these big structural problems um, what are the key factors that have led us to where we are today? Well, what I, uh, perhaps uh, the best way of responding is to use your framework. Uh, corporate supremacy, white supremacy, and the individual supremacy. Because if you look back over the last, uh, s let's say, 70 years, 72 years, post-World War II, I think that we can see the seeds of the problems beginning long ago. And it's interesting to me because I grew up uh, kind of lower middle class, uh, northeast, uh, not in a community that was very self-aware, certainly about 
corporate supremacy or white supremacy. Uh, and the individual supremacy was not issued because the community was still quite strong. It was a little town, but it had its own integrity. Uh, but corporations in those days were not so focused on maximizing shareholder well-being. In fact, before the takeover artists of the 1980s, most corporations really did respond to a kind of stakeholder capitalism. Uh, the CEO in the 1950s, for example, typically was making 20 times the average worker. Uh, today, it's almost 300 times the average worker. In the 1950s, about 33%, 35% of the workforce was unionized, private sector. Today, it's fewer than 7%. And uh, in the 50s, although women were second-class citizens, blacks and Latinos were second-class citizens, there were at least beginning, it wasn't the 50s, it was the 60s, just beginning a consciousness that we did have to do something. And I remember the civil rights movement and the civil rights, ultimately the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and efforts to provide more opportunities to women, just beginning. Things were at least moving in the right direction. And then came the 80s. Now, I've already mentioned Carl Icahn. I haven't mentioned him by name, so I won't. It's not fair to mention anybody by name. <laughs> and the takeover artists and their change of the corporations to, from stakeholder to shareholder capitalism. But one thing that came out of that was a huge, huge movement and really redistribution of money, wealth and income from workers to shareholders and CEOs and top corporate executives. It really is quite outstanding. In fact, uh, uh, there was a study that came out just about a month ago three academics who did put a lot of time and effort into this, and they found that, and they looked at these two periods of time. They looked at the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, versus the 80s, 90s, and et cetera, and they saw that before 1980, the shareholder, when, whenever shares went up, in fact, the stock market did go up somewhat in those years, about 60% of the increase in the value of the stock market was due to economic growth. After the 1980s, about 60% of the increase in the stock market, which increased much, much further, was due to taking money out of the pockets of workers. That's a huge change. And if we had more time, we'd get to, and I want to just mention this because I think that White, there's, this country has always had white supremacy. I mean, racism is not new. Race, racism goes right back to the beginnings, be, before the beginnings, 400 years. Uh, and xenophobia and the worst forms of nativism. But what is it that aggravated it more intensely starting in the 80s? I think it was that white men started to ha see their wages flatten start to get very anxious about change, started to get very worried because almost all of the economic gains were going to the top. They were not sharing in them, and it was just almost inviting demagogues. I'm not gonna call any Republican a demagogue. <laughs> but you get my drift. <laughs> because when you have that much built up frustration and anger, it's easy to channel it toward immigrants and toward African Americans and toward other who are them. And I think that that divide and conquer strategy has been used more and more. I remember Richard Nixon using it. You don't remember welfare queens. You know, this is dog whistle, this is dog whistle politics. But it starts increasing more intensely as wages start flattening and people get more and more anxious about their status. What's the percentage? Is it 90% of GDP growth right now that goes to 10% uh, of the people? I think that's the right statistic. It's somewhere around there. In the 80s, 
what was it then? Oh, very different. Very different, right? In it was fact, like six, I, I think it was like sixty percent, sixty percent, or th that it was that it was equally distributed. I forget what well, the numbers in, are in now. Term, in terms of income, yeah. uh, you had in the nineteen fifties and sixties, uh, the top ten percent were taking home roughly thirty percent, forty percent total income. Now really the top 10% are taking home about 60% of total income and almost all total wealth. The top 10% really have 82% of the total wealth yeah. uh, that is generated in any year. Uh, but the thing that we don't focus on is that wealth inequality is growing faster than income inequality. So if you look at the bottom half of this country, the bottom half, they have 1.5% of the wealth. Yeah, the statistic I use a lot is three people have in the country have the same wealth as the bottom 50 percent, which is 160 million. And guess what, guys? Two of them live in our state. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's just a fact. It wasn't a judgment. It's just a fact. <laughs> but here, but here's the, this. This gets back to you, Congresswoman, because. When you have that degree of income and wealth disparity that I think does affect everything else we're talking about, it does aggravate racism and xenophobia, and it does lead to a kind of individualism when everybody's competing with more intensely with everybody else because everybody's competing for the crumbs as, as the rest of the pie gets run off with. Uh, so from the standpoint of power, now, economists always say that economics is not necessarily a zero-sum game. You can have billionaires, but that doesn't take away from anybody else. But power is a zero-sum game. The more power is located at the top, the less there is, by definition, any place else. You are a member of the United States Congress. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and. And thanks, Seattle. Uh, but here's my question for you. Power is so differently allocated than it has been in this country since the 1890s. We have power that is more concentrated, corporate power and individual wealth. And how do you, as a member of Congress, deal with that? I mean, how that amount of money, that amount of power is just overwhelming Washington. How do you deal with it? Well, I think one of the first things is the thing that ties money to power is the way in which money is used to influence elections. And I really believe that one of the key things we have to do is pass, you know, dramatic reform to get money out of politics. And um, Uh, Elizabeth Warren and I have a sweeping anti-corruption bill that we've that we've introduced. Um, we Democrats, our first order of business when we took the majority was to pass HR one, which is a fantastic, uh, also a fantastic anti-corruption bill. Um, it does not take on what you know. One of the things I would like to do is take on this revolving door of lobbyists because you see Congress members and Paul Ryan just moved to Washington DC, moved his family there. Um, you see the lobbyists controlling everything. And so for one of the, you know, one of the first times I think in recent history, we have this situation where the majority of people in the, the country can believe that we should have gun reform through sensible background checks, 90% of Americans, and yet we don't get it. You know, the majority of people believe we should have immigration reform, and yet we don't get it. And so you see this happening over and over again, climate change. The, the, the vast majority of Americans believe climate change is real, and we need some sort of a Green New Deal to address it. And so th that, the fact that we don't get it done is, and I see it every day, it's because there is this horde of lobbyists and corporate cash that pours in. Um, it's why I don't take corporate PAC money, um, but I think, 
for a lot of members, it is it skews what we should do. So that's, I would say, the, one of the first things. I think the second thing is to really think carefully, since it's Labor Day, to think carefully about how we strengthen the power of workers to organize. And um, we have uh, something called the PRO Act, which would would give more power to workers to be able to organize. But I also think that we need to think about new ways of worker organizing. Um, I have a Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, a National Domestic Workers Bill of Rights that I've introduced with Kamala Harris that um, would really take on that sector of unorganized home uh, workers that are at home, domestic workers um, that are at home and include them in civil rights protections that they were left out of. But beyond that, Look at what's happened with the teacher strikes. And by the way, Seattle teachers, congratulations on your fantastic raises and fantastic bargaining agreement. Um, and thank you to the Seattle School District as well. I'm really, really proud of what happened here in Seattle. But if you look at the teacher strikes, those were sectoral strikes. They were enterprise strikes. And I think we do need to think about new ways of organizing that are about industries and sectors rather than companies, because I think that would give workers way more power. Um, so that's the second thing. And then I think that um, there's, a, there's a lot of other pieces to how we deal with uh, corporate power that, you know, everything from making sure that we, um, I think Medicare for All actually does that, and maybe that's because I'm biased, because I'm the lead sponsor of the Medicare for All bill in the House. But I do think healthcare is a human right. And I think that when you have people who are so dependent on um, certain things in order to get healthcare, whether it's an employer or whether it's GoFundMe, you simply cannot, you cannot amass the kind of power that you need to take on the structures that we have. So there's a number of different pieces here, but I think that um, all of those, and, and then I think immigration reform is actually it, it is solidifying power within the hands of corporations. It is allowing for us to be divided. It is, the, the lack of it, I should say, it is allowing for us to continue to have somebody to blame, an immigrant to blame. Well, you know, if we just had a general strike and every immigrant in the country refused to go to work, the country would shut down and people would understand that you actually need immigrants in this country um, and that we are valuable and always have been. But there is this push and pull in the United States of America that goes back to the Chinese Exclusion Act um, and before that to the original sin of racism and, and genocide of Native Americans. And so I don't know how, you know, I think the fact that we're, we have a reparations bill in the house that I'm a proud sponsor of, at least we can start to talk about some of these things that have been pushed to the side and really have not had any space um, to, to come forward. Well, I, I think on immigration, the only people who have standing to complain about immigrants are Native Americans. And they never have. Uh, but let me, go, let me just go back to policy for a second, uh, Congresswoman, because uh, I love policy. I teach policy. I breathe policy. I did policy. I work policy. I administer policy. But we're no longer in a policy world right now. We can come up with the best policies. It's easy to say, get big money out of politics. It's easy to say, Medicare for all. It's easy to say, Green New Deal. It's easy to say policy after policy. It doesn't matter. It's a chicken and egg problem. Because in order to get the policies enacted, we've got to have the power. And the people don't have the power. And so I'd like to get your reaction to the following hypothesis. It's a little bit radical. We'd expect nothing less. No, no, but I, but I, and I don't usually state it fully, as I'm about to state it in mixed company publicly, <laughs> but I will. We are in the habit in this country of seeing the great political debate as Democrats versus Republicans, or conservatives versus liberals, or big government versus small government, or all of the ways that we have been debating policy. 
I think that that's becoming obsolete. I think the real contest is between oligarchy and democracy. And some people agree with me, and I was a little bit nervous to even say that. It's Seattle. But Seattle, <laughs> that's why I love to come to Seattle. And by the way, I live in Berkeley, so <laughs> I have free speech. But here's the, but, but, but if, if that is the case, if the real battle is not the way we've been thinking about it, if it really is more and more centralized power and wealth at the top, creating constant decoys and diversions and everything else, divide and conquer strategies in terms of getting everybody else to not see what's actually happening. How do we, as politicians, as writers, pundits, whatever, how do we, as citizens, how do we take back power from the oligarchy? I spent 20 years as an organizer, and I, um, you know, I might recharacterize what you said. It's not that the people don't have power; it's that we don't use it, we don't exercise it, and um, that's not to say that there aren't huge barriers against us and money coming in against us. But the reality is, if you look at 2018 and you just think about the diversity of people that got elected across the country in districts that we never thought were possible, so Democrat and Republican kind of went out of, the, out of the door, and you look at the people of color that got elected, you look at the women that got elected, um, you saw something becoming possible. But in order for that to be the case, people have to have hope that if they participate in democracy, the democracy will actually be democracy. So in other words, if you elect somebody and they get the most votes, they should be president. Yeah. Right? Or, or the idea that if you elect somebody that they should not be sitting in their congressional seat or whatever elected office and saying, let me look at where the polls are today and let me determine my position based on the polling, which is not to say we don't look at polls. Of course we do. We're interested in them. We look at them. We get information from them. We make decisions partly based on polling. But I really believe that the American people are smarter than that. And what they want are people who are authentic and have integrity and will vote and then explain the vote, explain the vote, but actually use the position to lead from and not just to follow. And that, I think, is something that we, um, you know, we are still building that group of people who say, and there are many examples of this in the Congress today, especially with this new class that's been elected, where people say, you know what, I am going to do what I think is the right thing to do. And that means I will put my name on something that might be seen as controversial. But, and, and you even see it with some of the swing district Democrats who have come out for an impeachment inquiry. And yes, we're doing an impeachment teach-in on Saturday at Benaroya Hall. It is almost oversubscribed, I think, but Jamie Raskin, my colleague from Judiciary, is coming out and will explain the whole process of impeachment um, and what is the standing in the Constitution, what are the rights of Congress, of the Judiciary Committee, et cetera. So it really hopefully will be educational about what this all plays out to look like. But we have to start taking back our power. And that means we need to have people who are willing to speak to people that perhaps they haven't spoken to before. If you think about Obama in 2008 and you think about 2018, what happened is the electorate got expanded. People got inspired to believe that their vote actually mattered, that they were excited about the vision that, we, that was being proposed, that it wasn't just let's nibble around the edges, but these are deep structural problems that you've talked about, that we've talked about here, and they're not gonna be fixed by little nibbles around the edges. We will need bold structural change, and we will need people who are willing to do that and willing to put it forward, willing to build the, 
the uh, movement for it, and then we will need people on the ground who are ready to organize, who are ready to get people um, engaged, paying attention, and yes, voting. Well. I agree. <laughs> but let me play a role that I hate rook playing, and I never play, and I play it only in the shower, actually, with myself. <laughs> and that is Devil's Advocate. Um, if you look back at history, going all the way back to the oligarchies and the tyrants of history, all of recorded history, you see that there are several techniques used by oligarchs and oligarchies, small groups with huge wealth and huge power to retain their wealth and power. And one of the things they do, I've also already alluded to, and that is I call divide and conquer. That is, they stir people up. They get people angry at each other so they forget the real source of a lot of their problems. The second thing they do is they breed a kind of cynicism and powerlessness. They make people feel like things are so out of control and out of their hands that there is nothing whatever that they can do, and they just stop effectively reading the papers or being citizens, they give up out of just desperation and desolation and demoralization. A third thing that oligarchies do is they use entrenchment. They make it more difficult to vote. They suppress the vote. And in modern times, what we see is all over the country. The efforts to make it harder, not only to vote, but you alluded to the use of the Electoral College, the use of gerrymandering, a Supreme Court that says that partisan gerrymandering is okay, and we know that that is going to be used as a cue to do a lot of racial gerrymandering that is disguised as partisan gerrymandering. Purging of voter rolls. How, given these age-old techniques, divide and conquer, disillusionment and cynicism, and voter suppression, how do we and I'm saying all of us, not from a standpoint of a policy, because remember, we're in a chicken and egg problem. We can't get the policy until we're actually, we have power. How do we fight back against these techniques? I'll give you my two yes. cents yes. first. Tell no, me. I'll give you my two cents after. No, 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 tell, no, tell I, me yours. No, tell no, me I'm yours curious. Because you know, you're on the front line. <laughs> I want to know how you, what, how you no, think about these things. For me, it really does come, look, we, um, and, and I'm speaking now as an immigrant woman of color, we have been under attack for a very long time. And every time we have had the power structures levied against, against folks. That was true during slavery. It was true in all these different times over the course of history. And yes, the power systems were different at that time. They didn't exhibit in the same way. But the only way, I believe, for people to have power is to demand it. Frederick Douglass said, power never concedes anything without a demand. And so those tactics have to be at the grassroots level. And they do have to be um, universal. I mean, we, part of the reason I called out Larry Brown and April Sims op-ed is because they say, look, labor unions, and we have the best in the country. I mean, I'm so proud of our unions here in the state. Um, this is a common tactic that has been used for a very long time to divide and conquer. And so I really do believe that the ultimate answer is for people to refuse to allow their power to be taken away. That is not a quick fix. It may provide some gains in the most immediate future, but it is not a quick fix. And in order for it to succeed, we do need to address the threat that is in the White House that is using the most powerful bully pulpit that is around. Giving new meaning to bully. Yes, pulpit. <laughs> literally, literally, the bully in the bully pulpit. And so we have to address that because that is so much power 
um, that is being utilized from that spot in a very different way than it was ever imagined and that probably our founding framers ever imagined. It's not really, there isn't really the speed within the remedies, whether it's going to court or whether it's using Congress in a very divided time. So that is really what I believe, but I'm really curious because I think you have some answers. Don't you think he's got some answers he wants us to consider? So, so I'm really curious to hear what you think, Secretary Reich. <laughs> I don't have any answers, but I have some intuitions. Um, and one has to do with what I call progressive apartheid. That is, we live in our own progressive bubbles that are getting larger and larger, but have less and fewer and fewer senatorial representatives. And we talk to each other, and we become more and more certain of the righteousness of ourselves. But the question that I keep on struggling with is how we get out of our bubbles and how we actually force ourselves to go out and talk to people who disagree with us. Disagree with us. I tell my students, I tell my students the best way to learn anything is to sit down with somebody who disagrees with you. Because then your ideas and your fundamental assumptions are tested. And if you can listen carefully with an open mind and get them to also hear you, and the first way to get them to hear you is you hear them, then we can get someplace. But if we're just Berkeley and Seattle and all of these little blue places, some very large blue places, but they still are blue, they're not getting, we're not getting anywhere. So that's point number one. But point number two has to do with some experiences that some of you, just judging from how I see you from here, might remember, are old enough to remember. <laughs> now, I lived through the Vietnam War era and also the civil rights movement. And a lot of us were out on the streets a lot of the time. There was a lot of mass protests, a lot of mass movement, a lot of energy, and yet we're not doing that. Now, there are a lot of good reasons why we're not, but I think we have to. And I think we have to make a real ruckus. And I could go on, but I, this brings me to a question for you. Well, let, let, let me just say two things about that. Um, on the first one, I totally agree with you. And sometimes I ask people when they ask me what they can do because they have a rep that believes with, you know, agrees with them on many things. How many of you have family members that you have different political views from? And how many of you actually have those conversations with them? So this is a thing, right? It's an How many easy... of you are still on speaking terms with them? <laughs> but it's an easy place to, to start that engagement with loved ones, but most of the time we shy away from it. Um, but I think the other thing is I go on Fox News. I, I used to. I haven't, I haven't for a little bit because I've been so frustrated with how they cover things. But the reason I do that is because I think it does help us to understand and to talk. And even if the news anchors aren't with us, the people that are listening to Fox News need to hear something else. And, um, and I, do, I really do agree with you. On the second point about, to me that's organizing. What you talked about, general strikes, protests in the street. You didn't say, I, can you tell I have general strikes on my mind? But yeah, um, <laughs> just reviewing labor history, right? And thinking about this. But um, to me, that is a form of organizing. And coming from India just recently, thinking about nonviolent civil disobedience and the role that it has played a around the world here in this country and other countries and how we need to get back to some of the tenets of that and what it really means, not just, um, not just sort of the way it's being done where you block a street, but the deep 
training, strategic thinking around a target, figuring out exactly what that mass protest looks like and what that civil disobedience looks like and what is going to be on the line, not just going to jail for a night, but what is actually gonna be on the line. And I think that those are things that we need to retrain ourselves in and remind ourselves about the power of those kinds of nonviolent protests. Well, I think that one way of getting into that might be to take an issue such as big money in politics or uh, draining the swamp, something that a lot of conservatives and Republicans, at least at the level of the grassroots, would say they believe must be done and try to have a mass march, a mass movement, a general strike, a something that unites enough of us more visibly than ever before, at least in the last 20 years, and signals unambiguously that we are together about some fundamental principle of democracy. To totally agree. It's got to have some consequence, though, because we did that with the family separations. Within two weeks, we had half a million people in the streets. And it was not just Democrats. It was Republicans, Democrats, independents. But there needs to be a next place that we push to. So um, I'm getting the sign. We're getting the cane. Are we getting the yeah, cane? We're getting, Are we getting, we're getting pulled the off cane. the stage? Okay. No, we're not getting pulled off the stage. We're going to... We're going to turn now to questions, your questions. Questions, yes. Secretary Reich, I wonder if you'd comment on uh, the position that the Business Roundtable took recently on the role of corporations. Um, I think it's uh, better than nothing, but it's pretty close to nothing. <laughs> because what the Business Roundtable was essentially saying is, oh, it would be really, yes, we really do want to listen to and honor all our constituents. But the problem is there's, again, there's absolutely no reason to suppose they do or would. It's just public relations. Unless you change the structure of the economy and the structure of finance so that businesses have to listen to their workers. So workers are on the boards of directors. So workers have actually shares of stock in companies. So that companies actually have, so workers have more power and communities have more power and we're talking about real power here, that nice statement from the Business Roundtable is worth less than the ink that was spent in the cartridge that made the ink cartridge statement paper. A question about impeachment, and um, is, does it make sense to proceed with impeachment given that there's so much distraction with the election? That's part one. Part two is if proceeding with impeachment does, is, is a viable way to proceed. My question is for uh, Secretary Reich, would you consider uh, making videos uh, on the, uh, some of the more egregious examples of obstruction of justice from the Mueller report? Um, so, you know, we'll be able to talk about this all in detail on Saturday, but I'll just quickly say that, that we are already in an impeachment investigation. That means we at the Judiciary Committee are considering whether or not to recommend full articles of impeachment to the full House for a vote. And um, my question would turn that question around and say, can we afford not to consider impeachment? And, and, and the reason is, is somewhat devoid from the next election, which is if we give away that fundamental power that our framers gave to us in Article One. I mean, we are at least co-equal branches of government, but we're Article One. Congress is Article One. Then what does that mean for our democracy and for checks and balances? And does it mean you could have a dictator or a demagogue or, or anyone come in and basically do whatever they want for four years, maybe hope that the courts will save you, but literally take the power away from the body that is supposed to oversee? To me, it's a constitutional duty that we're sworn to do, and we just have to do it. 
On the videos, let me just recommend going to House Judiciary Dems Twitter account, and there are videos on the five, uh, there, there are 10 obstruction of justice events laid out, incidents laid out in the Mueller report. There are five that are particularly compelling, and House Judiciary has created very short, not the Secretary Reich type deep explainers that are there, but just a two minute video that would be um, really good for everyone to watch. But I think it would be great if the Secretary wanted to do that as well and go into those in some more depth. Uh, let me make a suggestion uh, for House Democrats, and you can carry this to Nancy Pelosi if you wish. <laughs> and the suggestion is, two things. Number one, that House Democrats make it very clear that impeachment under the Constitution is setting up a trial in the Senate. It is gathering the evidence. It is an inquiry. It is not actually a conviction of impeachment. That goes to the Senate. And number two, that it has already begun. So those two, yes. the public doesn't know either of those. Yes, it's been very confused. And I, I'm pretty sure that the secretary has a direct line to Nancy Pelosi anytime he wants it. But I will be happy to carry that message back. Um, in fact, I already have. Uh, but, but yes, I think it's been very confused. And I don't think it's done us many favors because people are confused. They don't, not everybody understands. People are still calling for an impeachment inquiry to start. Well, we're in the middle of an investigation right now. We have already filed that paperwork with the courts. Um, to say that that is why we need the documents quickly and we need uh, people to come and testify. Um, and then this, the second piece, that's why we're doing the impeachment um, teach-in, honestly, because I really feel like we need to be able to talk as a community about what this process is, what does it look like. It is a process. The Senate, the House can vote um, to, to forward the articles of impeachment to the Senate, but then the Senate can conduct its trial, which is what it is, and it can decide not to impeach. So people really have to understand that if, even if we t were to recommend, number one, even if we were to vote, number two, that still doesn't rid the White House of the man that is there. You understand that, right? Then it goes to the Senate, two-thirds majority to convict, so. Well, there has never been, in the history of this country, a, an impeachment conviction that is driven a president out of office. I think be, that's important. Be, yes, it, very important, though Richard Nixon resigned because it was so clear that he would be impeached. When the impeachment hearing started for Richard Nixon, the only 19% of the public thought he should be impeached. By the end, it was so inevitable because people had to, had to have the information laid out to them. So again, I just think we have to lay out the information for people and see where it takes us. Hi, I'm with T-Mobile Workers United. We're trying to organize a T-Mobile call center in Wichita, Kansas. We're part of uh, Communications Workers of America. Um, I was curious to th see what you guys think about, because uh, I guess I think one of the answers is positive reinforcement. What do you guys think of legislation that like revokes a lot of the tax cuts for corporations that were recently passed and uh, maybe awards corporations with tax cuts for engaging in collective bargaining with their employees? That's my idea. I, I, not only would I be in favor of that, but I just want to just say publicly for the record that T-Mobile Sprint proposed merger should not ever be allowed to take place. <laughs> These are two irresponsible firms. They're virulently anti-union, and T-Mobile, you know, T-Mobile is actually has its majority owned by a German company that has a supervisory board that is half workers. And I hope you are actively getting them involved. Good. Good. Mr. Reich, I want to know, in your life, who made you the kind of uh, activist and author that you are today? Who, who inspired you the most? when you were a student, when you started writing, what kind of people inspired you to be the kind of man you are today? Um, 
Well, that's a hard question to answer because it assumes the, that I agree with you about <laughs> what I do. But um, I'll tell you, uh, the, my mentor uh, when I was an undergraduate was a fellow named John Kenneth Galbraith. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and he was an activist. He was, uh, he was in the government. He was in the uh, administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt and uh, in the Kennedy administration. Right. And uh, a brilliant and deeply, deeply progressive in every bone man. Uh, the, his only problem was he was too tall. <laughs> he, was, he was six foot seven and we we never quite saw eye to eye. Well, I have to tell you too, I have to tell you too, reading you in the New York Times every day is the highlight of my day. And thank you for, for the work that you, for the articles that you, uh, that you put that are, appear in the New York Times. Well, they're terrific. Uh, let me just say, there, there are heroes that we ought to celebrate all the time. And, and we were talking about, um, Paul Wellstone a little while ago. And he reminded me that just before the vote uh, in the Senate uh, on the resolution uh, with regard to the Iraqi war, uh, Paul Wellstone and I were very good friends and he called me and he said, um, uh, I just got the results of the polls in Minnesota and about 85% of my constituents in Minnesota think we should go into Iraq. And uh, he said, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote against the resolution. And I said, well, that's very, that's very big of you, Paul, and I really admire you for it, but I don't wanna lose you, because you have an election coming up. And he laughed. And I said, why is he laughing? That's not funny. And he said, you just watch my polls, because I'm gonna vote my conscience and I'm going to explain to the people of Minnesota why I am voting the way I am, and my polls are actually going to go up. And I said, well, good luck. And he was, he was right. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I have a question about uh, Medicare for All. Um, it's kind of two parts. One relates to what you were talking about, which is how do you envision Medicare for All actually passing a Congress that even if the Democrats won in 2020, even took over the Senate, there are so many special interests involved, um, health care, or excuse me, um, insurance companies, et cetera. And the other part is, you, I think you proposed like a two-year transition. And I was wondering how you uh, conceive of that happening so quickly with something that's, I think, almost 20% of GDP or something like that. Yeah, Thanks. thank you for those questions. Um, I just think that these policy ideas have so much opposition because they are so powerful. So if you look at polling across the country, if you talk to Americans every day, this is the thing that they know about. They know their family member, their daughter, their son, their loved one has died because they can't get a cancer treatment or is suffering because they can't get insulin. You know, these are real issues for people. Half a million Americans every year are going into bankruptcy due to medical costs. The most popular insurance program is GoFundMe, the charity of your neighbors. Insulin costs 10 times as much as it does in Canada. And so this is a real issue for people and they understand it deeply and so they're not as quick to be fooled by all the money that's pouring in. That said, 300 to 400 million dollars, Bernie and I calculated, at least that we know of that's being poured into defeating Medicare for all. And, um, and yet, it is still a national conversation on the stage and it's because of activists and nurses and doctors and labor leaders and all of you in the room who have been fighting for this. And we have 118, we have over half of the Democratic caucus on the bill. We've had three hearings in the House of Representatives for the first time in the history of our country. We're talking, we're actually having hearings on a single payer bill. That has not happened before. And so it is not gonna be easy, 
but we are continuing to build power and momentum. And the thing that we really need to do that we haven't been able to do yet is fully explain um, exactly what Medicare for All is so that people understand it. And um, the Secretary and I were talking about uh, private insurance, and we should be clear that Medicare for All envisions a system that is guaranteed government insurance. So no matter where you go, no matter what job you have, you have the same insurance and that is provided by the government, but private insurance companies, we're not getting rid of them, they can exist. They just can't provide duplicative coverage, which is what we have right now in Medicare. Um, and so we need to be clear about what these things are. We need to be clear that it doesn't limit your choice to do that. We're using the same network of doctors and hospitals. Guess what? The people that are dying today, the 70 million Americans who are uninsured or underinsured, they don't have any choice. Um, and we will actually expand choice because we won't have out-of-network hospitals. So anyway, all of those details we need to be able to explain, but the secretary was making the point to me earlier that we have to be careful not to go too deeply into the weeds. So this is part of the conundrum, is how do we explain and counter some of the things that are out there but not get pulled down into the weeds? Quickly on, on two years. Bernie's bill is four years. I decided to make mine two because a lot of the economists I spoke to, by the way, 200 economists have come out, signed a letter supporting our bill, which is really fantastic. Um, but two years is not actually that long when you think about the fact that Medicare is already enrolling huge numbers of people. Um, when Medicare and Social Security were introduced, there were no computers but I think it was a year um, that was the transition time. So we can do this, we need, to, we need to combine our computer systems, make sure that works, but then we really should be able to transition. And so in my plan, the first year is doing that, the preparation work, the second year covers 65 and, uh, 55 and over and 19 and under, and then by the third year, everyone is on board. Why not have a longer transition plan? Because if you do, you have to keep a system in place, the current system in place, which is actually gonna probably drive costs up, according to the economists I've spoken to, because they know they're gonna leave the marketplace. They know it's gonna be done. So you're basically dragging out a process, probably driving costs up, and people will get frustrated because they're not gonna see things change quickly. They're gonna be waiting for four years. And so we think two years is the right. But listen, if we get to the part where we're actually figuring this all out and people want to debate me about two years versus three, happy to do it. Those are details. They don't really matter in the long run. What matters is the will to do it and um, really having the courage to take on the special interests that benefit from the current system. Hi. I have a, a question for mostly for uh, Dr. Reich. Um, reading Piketty, um, Capitalism in the 21st Century, he pretty well illustrates that capitalism leads to an oligarchy versus democracy uh, economic system. So that is something that underlies our country. That is something that he argues has underlain what has happened since 1980 that 1950 to 1980 was an anomaly. And I'm wondering how you would approach breaking down that underlying momentum almost of what capitalism does. Do you, he has an idea of a universal um, tax on capital, but I wonder if, if anyone else has broached other ideas. Well, you have to start somewhere, and I think that his idea is a first cousin to Elizabeth Warren's idea in terms of a wealth tax on very high incomes. And that's where I would begin. There is absolutely no reason that anybody needs the incentive of being a multi-billionaire to work hard. In other words, we have this odd thing in this country right now in which conservatives and Republicans for years have been saying, with the oligarchy behind them, well, if you're very rich, you need the incentive and the motivation of even more money to work harder. If you're a working class person, you need the incentive of the possibility of less money to work harder. They can't just both be right. Uh, 
And uh, I, I just think you've got to go after the billionaires first. Is Jeff Be Bezos in the audience? I, I don't, it struck me that he might know. Hi, I'm a shop steward for my store uh, with uh, UFCW 21, and we're currently in contract negotiations, and we're at a meeting, we had a question come up that I couldn't really answer, and that was, what are the benefits to the corporate powers that be if they would pay us more? And I had a few ideas, but I was wondering if you guys would probably know the exact answer. <laughs> well, I can start. I, I think that the research shows that one of the biggest benefits of paying workers more is you get less turnover, more loyalty. You don't have to spend as much. One of the biggest hidden expenses that companies deal with is the cost of retraining and the cost of basically getting people on the experience curve again. And if you pay them, if you pay people more, they simply will stay. They'll be lo more loyal. Um, a lot of, uh, there's also a lot of literature about the myriad ways in which workers who don't feel an ownership stake, and this gets us into laws that make it more, even, even more, even easier for companies to become employee stock ownership dominated, but there's a lot of literature that those companies do better. They have a higher return to investment. Workers on the front line know how to improve productivity better than anybody from a business management school from McKinsey who's kind of going in and doing a report. It's the people on the front line who know this stuff. And so you've got to give them a, an ownership interest. And I could go on for another half an hour on this. It's one of my favorite topics. I just wanted to add one thing, which is when we were fighting for 15 here in Seattle, this um, question came up a lot, that if we raise the wages, it's going to hurt businesses. And we made uh, the argument, which I think has shown true in the research, which is that if you raise the wages, those workers have more money. They're not at the top of the scale. They're not going and putting that money into savings or, you know, things like that, they're actually spending it back in the economy. And so it's a cycle that also benefits the economy. When workers have more money, they spend it. When they spend it, businesses do better. When those businesses do better, the workers should do better. That should be a principle that if the businesses are doing well, the people that are fueling those businesses should also do well. And so that's, that's another and, and uh, wish you good luck in the contract negotiations, UFCW. Can I, can I just pick, I know we have a limited time and we want to get to your questions, but this principle that when you pay people more or people take home more money, they actually spend it and keep the economy going and create jobs is one of the most important principles that stands in sharp contradistinction to what's happening in the economy in which more and more of the winning uh, the wages and the wealth in the economy are going to the top. People at the top don't spend. They just don't spend. They save, and they save all over the world. They save in the Bahamas. They put it into everything you can imagine. They're not putting it in the local economy. They're not creating jobs. And we've got to get that word out very loudly and clearly. Hello, this is uh, mainly for Congresswoman Jayapal, but I don't want to be exclusive. Um, if, uh, do you see a role of how the legislature, and or indeed maybe the, whether they should, be involved in compelling or at least making it easier for corporate boards to include members of organized labor on those boards? Yeah, and there are some proposals around this as well, but I think that's what the secretary was talking about. If you actually had boards, and in places in Europe do this, if you actually had boards that had representation from the workers and from management, you would have that buy-in, and you would have power at the highest decision-making places. So I, I do think that those are the kind of structural reforms that we need to make, and it goes to the point of who fuels, who fuels the wealth that a corporation makes? 
it is the workers, it is the people that are doing the work. And if you look at manufacturing processes and research that's been done around manufacturing processes, the, the most efficient assembly lines are the ones where workers have the ability to make changes to whatever's happening. So yes, I'm in favor of those kinds of pieces of legislation. How can you do that as a legislator? Do you, do you have ideas about making that easier to, to accomplish? It, I mean, yeah, there, there are some bills now, I think we would, in the PRO Act, we don't go that far, but there are some ways in which we start to set up those kinds of um, structures for workers to actually participate in decision making. Um, I, I'd have to go back and look at what legislation is out there right now, but um, I think you can, you can legislate it. You can do it through the Articles of Incorporation. I mean, you... Yes, you through the Articles of Incorporation, but you can also... Basically, a corporation has limited liability and it has eternal life. Those are two things given to it by state governments and also indirectly by the federal government, on top of which there are all kinds of other tax benefits that corporations get. There is no reason the federal government couldn't say, well, if you want limited liability and you want eternal life and you want all these tax benefits, then here's what you have to do. These are the conditions. One condition is you've got to have half of your board, em your employees. And, and why do we have to have eternal life? I mean, that's another question, because I know there was a time when it was 20, 30, 10, 20, 30 years, it was an eternal life, and I don't, that would probably be very hard to roll back, but you know, I do think that we should relook at these things that have just sort of emerged and become a standard. They weren't always the case. Hi, I was wondering if you'd be willing to take on one of these three things. One, uh, I ask people to get involved, and the answer is, I vote, and that's the end of the conversation. So if you had something insightful for that situation, Number two, uh, ask people about getting involved and they say, well, I don't want to impose my views on somebody else. So if you have something insightful to say about that. And, and number three, option, all these are optional. Uh, you have this great canvas behind you. Uh, it seems underutilized. I'm wondering if you would consider putting up something up there that people would learn from something, you know, top three takeaways of the night or something <laughs> like that. To, so our people are visual learners too, not just audible. So take those however you want, whatever, any insights you got. Well, uh, look, I, I, I think we need to, as a society, as a nation, we need to inculcate in our young people and in, certainly in ourselves, the notion that citizenship is not just voting or serving on juries or paying taxes. Citizenship is an active practice. Now, that's hard. Let's acknowledge that that's hard. A lot of people, we have working families, they're working all hours, they're trying to bring up kids, they're trying to get a lot done, they don't have the time. But in my experience, if people think something is important enough, they will give it time. And there is nothing more important than our democracy, nothing. Uh, now, one other piece of that. The reason I spend as much time as I do teaching over the last 40 years, that's really what I've done mostly, is because I believe in these young people. And this is something that you who are parents and grandparents, you can do. This young generation has voted in 2018 to a much greater extent. They, we, we broke all records in terms of young people voting in 2018. They are, it's terrific. They are also, my students, this generation are the most committed and dedicated and involved and public service oriented of any generation of students I have ever, ever encountered. Number th and number three, many of them because I've been teaching so long, but many of them over the last five or six years are getting involved in politics. They're getting involved in local politics uh, and they are doing wonderful things. Uh, one of my students here in Seattle, I came up, uh, Andrew Lewis, are you here? You're running for city council. There he is, Andrew. I say to my students, go out and change the world, but start with your local city. 
And Andrew took me literally. <laughs> and thank you, Andrew. But this is, this is a time of being incredibly appreciative of our young people, but also instilling in them a sense that they have inherited a mess and they are going to have to clean it up and make this a more perfect union and they have the power to do it. Politics is a privilege, a privilege. Well, you talk about in your book um, to your public service and I think that there are so many young people that I talk to who would love that? You know, the public service loan forgiveness was in that concept. Now Betsy DeVos is rolling that back. But the idea that that service is a service not only to the country, but also a service to the person as they learn and they grow and they're able to contribute and they think about their work as being far more than just the vote. But in the end, I would just say that people will do things when they are inspired to do them. And so we also, have to be inspiring <laughs> and we have to have ideas that are not just about opposition or about minimal change around the edges but about proposition about vision about calling people into something that is different than what they see today because my 22 year old tells me that what they see today is no planet you know interminable student loans and no real opportunity because it is an oligarchy. It is controlled by corporate power. And so we've got we've to inspire people by having ideas that, that are of the caliber of ending slavery and sending a man to the moon and giving women the right to vote. Those are things that America is good at. We have been good at redefining and reimagining who we are in a way that is bigger than what is in front of us but is looking forward, and I think that's ultimately what gets people engaged. So we have time for three more, unfortunately, but, um, so I think we've got one, two, three, three. Okay, yeah, one, two, three. Hi, my name is Sarah, and um, I'm an elder millennial, um, which means that, <laughs> I belong to a generation whose biggest work category is freelancer, gig economy worker, consultant. And it means that we don't have any labor protections except hiring a lawyer, and many of us can't afford to do so. So as we're talking about oligarchy and power and the ability to organize, to this sector of the economy that is a growing and I would say hard scrabble sector of the economy, what ideas do you have for policies, practices that could help support this sector of the economy and being a more powerful or empowered force? Thanks. Shall I begin? Uh, well, first of all, uh, there's got to be, and there will be, and California is just about two weeks away from enacting tough legislation that prevents companies from misclassifying workers as independent contractors when they really are employees. And it's going on all over the country and we need ultimately federal law about that. Secondly, uh, people who are genuinely independent contractors, gig workers, uh, they need to start joining together in associations that give them not quite the power of labor unions, but some power of being a member of a team or a group that can, because they have purchasing power, because they have bargaining leverage, because they stick together, begin to really have the sense that they, and with employees and suppliers, uh, they can do more united than they can as individuals. Uh, finally, and you struck on something that I worry about a lot, this disempowerment. Uh, one of the aspects of disempowerment that's going on right now is not only gig work, but it's also the internet. A lot of people think that they are being politically active because they are clicking on petitions and they are doing things online, and that is not political activity. That is nice feeling but unless you're actually organizing and working together and 
meeting one-on-one -on -one and building relationships, you are not building political power. And people have got to understand that, whether they're gig workers or they are just nice, what, what slacktivists. Is that the new term? <laughs> but thank you. Okay, a couple of things. Um, I agree with you, we need to take the streets. I have been promoting that for months on end. Um, Hong Kong is out there every weekend for a dozen weeks now, and we sit on our asses, pardon my French, and do nothing. I need us to find an inspirational leader like Martin Luther King to take to the streets. Does anyone in this room think if we struck for one week that our bosses would not start changing things? Does anyone believe that would not happen? Why cannot we find leaders in Congress to help us take to the streets and solve these problems that we all know need to be solved but are getting nowhere because the people are not getting involved to demand the change? Secondly, social media outrage is gonna change nothing. We need to harness that into doing something actually physical. And tell Katie Porter I love her. Katie's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's no, we, if, if you're gonna wait for one leader, you're gonna be waiting a long time. You gotta find, and I say that trying to do whatever I can and, and when, whenever I can. Secretary asked me how many times I've been arrested. I said three, he said that's nothing compared to how many times he's been arrested, um, but. <laughs> But, you know, we have been on the streets, we've been organizing, but we need everybody to really take, take that step of, of engagement. And it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of explanation, it takes inspiration, and it takes real organization. And it takes real training. When we did our civil disobedience action many years ago, my first one, we prepared for months and if you look at what the civil rights movement did, and I've been down with, you know, had the honor of my lifetime to go with John Lewis down to the South. He leads the civil rights pilgrimage every year. And when you see the amount of work that went into the trainings and the, and the community networks that shuttled people during the, during the bus strikes, um, it was a tremendous amount of organization. It wasn't just showing up on the streets one day. That happened. But that only came out of a lot of work. And so I think we need to have a real conversation about what that looks like, training around these nonviolent practices that can be used, and um, strategic thinking also around that. Um, Katie Porter's fantastic, and we worked very hard at the Congressional Progressive Caucus to try to, to actually get the agreement to put new members on what we call the A committee. So we got agreement from Pelosi to give us 40% of all of the A committees, including financial services. And so when you look at Katie Porter and you look at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and you look at some of these new members that are doing such a phenomenal job on that committee, it's because we held our power as a progressive caucus, leveraged it in exchange for some victories like this one. Hi, Pamela. Argu arguably the best way, or the single policy that would affect wages the most is raising the minimum wage. And I have two questions about raising the minimum wage. One, how can we get this into the conversations like in the presidential debates? We're not talking about that as much. And the other is a much more difficult one, and that is that fighting for 15 in Seattle makes a lot of sense. In some other places, 15 is way too high, and the scene is too high. There's a difference in cost of living. How can we encourage at the national level the raising of the minimum wage at the state level and at the city level that will um, be appropriate to the differences in the, in the cost of living? The first question is, how do we get minimum wage into the conversation much more often and so we actually see it happen? I mean, you know, we don't see that as one of those major things. Maybe it's buried in, you know, things like the Green Deal, deal but it's not, we're not hearing about it. And that's the single biggest thing that makes an impact on people's lives. 
Let me just maybe start and say that I think the reason it's not in the conversations is because we won the public opinion battle on 15 and raising the minimum wage. We passed it with unanimous support from the Democratic caucus. Any presidential candidate that says they don't believe in raising the minimum wage to 15, thanks to the fast food workers that started that fight. Um, you know, I, I really think that's part of the reason. I, I would just say, Diana, that um, I actually, and I'm gonna ask the secretary to weigh in on this, but I don't believe the 15 is too high anywhere in the country. Um, maybe that's not what you maybe that's not what you were saying but you know i think that actually 15 like it, it goes the other way you look at certain cities like seattle and 15 doesn't really cut it here um and so yeah and so we had to really fight back the attempts to have regional minimum wages or to have you know different wages for rural communities than we did. We need one minimum wage. And when you think about how long it's been since the minimum wage has been increased and how we would be well over $20, $21 if it had kept up with inflation. Thanks to the labor movement in Washington state, we have, we're one of three states that had inf uh, minimum wage tied to inflation. It goes back to, I think, 1990, is that right, labor folks? 99, 99, um, and so that's part of the reason our wage is so high, but. This well, uh, just uh, quickly, since 1938, we have had a federal minimum wage. States can always raise their state minimum wages higher, and indeed, we always assumed that cities could raise it even higher than states until a few states started passing laws that prevented their cities in their states from doing that. but. What has happened is that the federal minimum wage that was raised, last raised in 2009 to $7.25 an hour has not been changed and inflation has eroded that to the point where it's now about $6.10 an hour. Uh, it's, it's ludicrous. And so we do have to have a federal minimum wage. I totally agree with the Congresswoman. It should be at least $15 nationally. And then above that, various states and cities can raise that. But let me emphasize something that's often left out of this conversation. We should not in this country have anybody who is working full time and poor. Nobody. So rather than start with the minimum wage and how high it should be, I think we should start with two propositions. No working poor and no non-working rich. Well, anyway, we, we have just, did you well, say no private property? Thing. I'm sorry, we have to end it right <laughs> at this point. Uh, it has been such a privilege for me to be back, and Congresswoman, thank you for what you are doing. You are blazing a wonderful trail, and I really appreciate it. So do all of you. Secretary Rice. I wish you were our Secretary of Labor right now. <laughs> but I just wanna, I wanna thank you for um, your incredible years of service working in four different administrations and continuing to share ideas and knowledge and help educate um, students, so many students that are coming out and, and making a difference today. And we are just so grateful that you've picked Seattle as your second home to Berkeley, it sounds like, since you're in town hall so much. We invite you to come back, right, Seattle? Come back again. Come back and see us. Thank you, everybody. One more time, Pramila Jayapal and Robert Reich.